So I'm Ken Coles again, and we've got Dr. Tom Jensen. Thanks so much for coming, Tom. We're going to talk about something old and something new. It's like a wedding. We even got something blue. Do you want to help us out too? <laughs> oh, shit, that rhymed. <laughs> so anybody, uh, you get a free hat if you tell me what this machine is. Strip till? I, uh, I go with strip till. So this is actually a, a, strip, mill, a strip till machine that I borrowed from uh, folks up in Monsanto at, at Carsland. And the, the guy that was working there was from Ontario, so he was pretty keen on getting this machine and apparently they've never used it. Uh, so I was the first person to use their, their strip till machine. It's a pretty heavy duty rig, as you can see. My uh, little tractor was a little bit outgunned for it. So as I was unloading it, I rammed it straight into the beaver tail and got it so jammed I had to get a giant front end loader to lift it off for me. But we did actually get it to get it running smoothly. And if you come to the, the field school, we'll go through that plot and we were really focused on corn because we just finished this three-year project on how do we integrate dryland grain corn into our cropping systems and strip till is sort of a, a, a potential benefit and one of the big reasons uh, they like strip till is it's sort of like a halfway step towards a zero till type system but it does as you can see they've got these residue cleaners so it, it pushes the residue out to the side and you're welcome to come and take a, a closer look, but they've got these big heavy duty shanks. So while they're doing this strip tillage practice, it's often in the fall. So they, they think, well, let's deep band our fertilizer as well. So in the corn belt, they do use a lot of potassium, a lot of uh, phosphorus. So they'll, they'll band this anywhere from six to 10, 12 inches deep, and then come in the following spring. And then the, the planter, which isn't really designed for a zero till environment plants into this nice black and strip row you can look behind us the actual corn plots there uh, you'll see there's a nice black spot and then there's no tillage so this works all great fine and dandy on a 30 inch row spacing but when we try to incorporate this into sort of our agriculture you know 9 to 12 inch row spacing on small grains this become this type of scenario becomes a little bit difficult however we just recently were approved funding for a project to actually look at deep banding phosphorus, potassium and copper in wheat, canola and peas. So why would we care about deep banding and mobile nutrients? You guys have any ideas? Phosphorus isn't really mobile. Right? It's pretty immobile, yeah. yeah well, it's kind of by the, yeah. by the, by the soil. So the part the plant uses is immobile. The part that the plant, the available part, is pretty immobile. Yeah. So why would you want to bury a phosphorus? That's what I just asked you. <laughs> Does anybody have any Start ideas? Start passing those around. So phosphorus rich zone where the roots can get to. So we know that phosphorus is is generally rather immobile and unavailable to plants. Uh, there are tons of a, a huge bank, but the, the fractions that the plant needs is often unavailable. So what do we do in zero tillage over and over and over again? Or what do we Shallow. not do? <laughs> well, you, you probably do put fertilizer down, but where do you? Yeah, so that's one. You're going to a good point there too, potentially. You're talking about the pop-up effect? Seed plays phosphorus, yeah. You know what, in our presentations, we actually make you guys think, so sorry about that. So what's, yeah, what's different, what's different from zero till than tillage? This is pretty straightforward. What's the difference between zero till and tillage? Tillage? Tillage. Holy shit. So, and the other thing that you do is you keep putting the plant residues back on the soil surface over and over and over again. And that's actually a really good source of available phosphorus for your plant. So, do you guys think we have soil uh, nutrient stratifications in Canada? Is it a problem? Why? Because it's not where it should be. Well, I just found an article from 2008 in the Top Crop Manager where 
the title actually says, yeah, nutrient certification exists, but Tom Jensen says it's not a big concern. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you give us your, your background history? <laughs> what, um, don't worry, worked, there's no top crop writers yeah. here today. <laughs> I work with uh, the International Plant Nutrition Institute, and you know, as we, in the late, early 80s, and then as we went through the conversion over to a lot less tillage, that, um, in, you know, in Western Canada, the bulk of phosphorus is put down in the seed row. Now, it, it's an old practice. Uh, early research showed if we put it in the seed row, it was very efficient, and that worked fine. And when we were growing lower yielding crops, where we needed less, lower rates of phosphorus to replace what we were removing in the harvested portion, that seed row works really well and it's very convenient, easy to do. But as we have went to higher yielding genetics, especially in the canola, and we want to put all this product down in the seed row, you know, then people started side banding it, which is certainly an option. But the reality is we can't have as much fertilizer as we need to put down for a replacement too close to the seed. And so, you know, you can side band it. And then with stratification, the early research, you know, probably after 15, 20 years of research when this was written, is that it didn't seem to be a problem. The plants seemed to be accessing the phosphorus. Under no-till, you have more moisture closer to the surface. We tended to have more feeder roots closer to the surface. So we didn't, weren't that concerned. But a lot of the fields now are 30, 40 years no till. We're getting definite stratification towards the surface. When we get a, a dry spring after planting, there's a good chance we could have nutrients stranded on the surface that the roots aren't going to get very well. And uh, so. Part of the research we're involved in is, what about fall banding? Now, when we say deep, it's, it's not like these units where they're, they're going down 9, 12 inches. When we say deep banding, we're looking at maybe 10 centimeters, 4 inches. And, um, you know, it's, why wouldn't you want to band deep? Why, what would be the big... Well, the roots, when they first come out, may not get it. No, well, let, let's do the assumption we could always put some starter okay. fertilizer in the seed row, which is probably a good idea. So, besides side that, side we have too much to put in the seed row. Side banding, is side banding shallow to the side may work, may not. What about banding it deeper? But we, we banded it one inch over and one inch down. That's where you replace the phosphorus. Yeah. So, it's not, is that not correct? For a lot of the units, it is, yeah. And so the question, there's a lot of research evidence, especially for taproot crops like canola, the root grows down. There's, there's side branching, but if you can put the phosphorus below that seed row, it's actually very efficient and works well. But why wouldn't you want a deep band? What? It's an extra operation. Extra operation, and what? And you lose moisture. Yeah. And increase the risk of erosion. And it does burn more diesel fuel too. You know, it's um, in a lot of our direct seeded systems. You know, we're we're pretty good on burning less diesel fuel than we used to. So it is going to take more energy to deep band. We are going to have more soil disturbance, but in some cooler areas, a little soil disturbance isn't bad. And that that's why these strip till units for corn. Corn does not like cool soils. And so in the northern corn belt, these do very well. They band their phosphorus in the fall, they till those strips, they can plant sooner, the soil warms up faster. It's good for corn production. So, um, there's some potential benefits of, of banding some of that. We don't have to put so much it, it in the seed row. The, the, the vertical switch that people are trying to. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but anyways, I'll hand it back to Ken. I've probably said enough. No, that's fine. Yeah. I, I wanted to give you guys a chance to see the unit, that this is not a new practice. Like, uh, this has been talked about for 30 years or more now. 
but there's more and more talk about this within our type of agriculture and it's because yeah we've been zero tilling for 30 40 years but you know what we always like to compare to is the native prairie and the native prairie is actually quite stratified when it comes to nutrients too but you know they had these buffalo that came around once in a while and they crap the jam their feet in and honestly that's like a tillage operation there's another process that happens is that you depend on the plant taking the phosphorus back down so the material that is in the roots itself can help increase the cycling so the truth of the matter is is we don't know if this is a good practice or not and that's the whole point of the research study so if you're looking for answers from us you're not going to get any we can tell you about past uh, past information got some nice uh, papers that you could read if you're interested that will help along the concepts but it really is about soil availability uh, what's what's good for the plant and does it make logistic sense one nice benefit as well is that in our case we're going to deep band our phosphorus three times the normal rate and only do it once every three years so that would leave a little bit of room for a simplified drill you know we really get caught up in all of these different tanks and blends and such so if that practice actually worked, may, maybe there's some logistics benefits as well. In, in North Lake this year, where they were dying for the soil to dry out, this would, this would have been a benefit. Done yeah, year. and we always but hear one of the biggest, uh, I guess, counter arguments to zero till is that cool soil in the spring thing. And, you know, we did have that a little bit this year. <laughs> then we went from frozen wet soils to dry soils and 30 degree weather. So you have plants that are growing faster than uh, the soil can actually deliver. So, so that's, that's something else to consider, that every year, every condition is different. So you're kind of setting yourself up. A couple of things that I can mention though, that I learned in planters myself, is that um, the current design, we get way better germination uh, out of a strip till machine than, than trying to zero till with a planter. So there's that to consider. And what do you got down to? What's that? You mentioned that 30 inches was dry for. What, what, what do you got down to? Well, on the canola study, we're doing 12 inch rows. That's actually perfect. Yeah, it's that's actually that's really that's great. That's and on that canola study, we've actually started to see, because a really good point that Tom mentioned is that we're pushing yield boundaries that were never even dreamed of. So, uh, that, what is it, Brady's law, the law of limiting factor? Usually it's moisture around here. Maybe it's not anymore. Maybe, maybe it is phosphorus. Maybe it's another nutrient. But when we were getting up to 60 pounds an acre on a phosphorus study that we were actually looking at seed safety, we started to see yield bumps. We were pushing 100 bushel canola with, uh, with really high phosphorus. So, so that actual, yeah. So we may be shortchanging our crops. And I think I've seen Tom present a number of times they've done national studies that that's really proving that 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 phosphorus uh, low or phosphorus requirements are not being met. Yeah, we're yeah. mining phosphorus. Mining phosphorus. Yeah. yeah. Just I did we did give you a handout. This just shows for the major plant nutrients, the mobility. Now I don't like the term immobile. <laughs> it nutrients are not immobile. Just some of them are really less mobile. Okay. So I I sort of change. I say almost immobile. And so some of these nutrients, they react with uh, the soil matrix and with cations in the soil. They do not move much at all. And just, this just shows you the, the inches are, the squares are inches. And it just shows relative to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, how far those nutrients can move in a year of application. This is low soil? Yes. And, you know, certainly nitrogen, once it gets changed over to nitrate moves, can move up to a meter with the water. Uh, potassium is intermediate. It can probably go up about four inches to uh, 10 centimeters in a year, moving the soil. And phosphorus, the reality is, and a lot of it, it might move three millimeters in the soil. So, and, and each nutrient is different. So I just gave you a list showing the different nutrients. A lot of our micronutrients, besides molybdenum uh, and boron and chloride, uh, they tend to be quite less mobile in the soil. And so if you can place them where the roots are going to grow, in the seed row where the roots are going to grow soon, you have a better chance of using them. 
Of course, we always have the, al the alternative. If we're things, conditions are good, we can use foliar applications. And that's a technology that can work very well uh, and for certain nutrients and in certain applications. No, but this anyways. Thing, this thing is put to liquid fertilizer, right? This one is set up for a liquid, yeah. 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 You dropped your pen there. I could ask Tom a question. So like in the fall, if you've got a, an applicator to put down fertilizer deep, could you put down more nitrogen and phosphate and sulfur, because canola uses a lot of sulfur, and get it down there four inches deep, is it going to be in the right spot when you seed the next year? Like how do you... We've got these fancy GPS technology now too that oh. actually changes things yeah. a little bit from the past practices. You you could yeah you the RTK is expensive yeah. Okay. yeah but, but you could plant just to the side. Actually, if it's a tap root right below is nice, but it's hard to get a good seed yeah, bed. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually, if you can plant maybe a couple centimeters to the side, then the the roots will grow into oh, okay. that area. So okay. it, if you can get that accuracy of planting, yes. Um, okay. There's some. So let's all, think about the yeah. concepts. We're actually going to go over the trial now. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get everybody to load up on the trailer and we'll continue the discussion. Okay, everybody, we're going to get rolling again. Claudette's been handing out some soil samples. So uh, there's more thinking again. It's a little bit after lunch. The, the neurons are firing. How do you like our strip till well, machine? It's more just look pretty fancy. So yeah, our plot seeder, we have four bolts, we just drop it. And what I normally use for our plots is a pillar laser sidebanding unit. But uh, I didn't think I could get it to go six inches deep. So we just switched it to our, our stealth shank, rigid shank. And we were quite easily able to hit that five to six inch deep you're not, band. You're not sweeping, sweeping anything aside either. So. No, and you know, we worried about the soil disturbance. Yeah, it, it definitely flops it up. But it's not, it's not really like a, a full out cultivation or disc or even a plowing type scenario. In fact, if you look back towards there, you can kind of see the, the raised plots. That's where we did the deep banding. So this is a pretty big trial. It's a 27 treatment trial, but we've got three crops, peas, lentils, and canola. We learned, uh, first of all, this project was just funded sort of this spring. So we didn't get to do the fall banding that we like to. We actually banded this spring and then followed up with a with seeding right away so you can see the peas and the wheat are coming nice but we kind of messed up our canola seed bed so the canola is a little bit slow to come and i'm thinking it's mostly a depth seed bed type type issue that we came from so you can see we all have uh a lot of a lot of people have shank type openers so a a, a, a deep banding operation is possible without having to get one of those great big massive strip till machines and if you have the proper packing maybe even uh, pull so, pull a roller after it too, just to smooth, it smooth things back out. I think we could probably get by without uh, without doing too much damage, like a, as far as the tillage is concerned. Go ahead. I thought no reason why you might want to do it too. A lot of guys up north, for, like when I say north, I mean North Edmonton, right? Um, they they complain that they can't put their fertilizer down with the seed. They, Absolutely. So, so now yeah. you'll be able to save two things. You'll be able to go further before he has to fill up. His machine, his, his, his planter, yeah, and he, you know, you'll be able to take care of it at a time when it's less pressure, like the fall. Exactly, so. that's a, a real logistics that's right. benefit. That's why uh, dribble banding is so popular down here too. Is you can get over your land with the sprayer so much faster than you can at seeding. And there's so much research that shows how important early seeding is. But we 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 are now pumping out so much fertilizer. We're fertilizing first and seeding second. And I think there is an opportunity to go back to simplifying yeah. our, our units. This and just go a long way to selling yeah. people how to plant early. So. Yeah, yeah, it helps. The logistics on a big farm it makes a, sooner, makes a will... massive difference. Yeah. So that's great. You were thinking about it. Anybody else have any comments or thoughts they'd like to share? I would. All right. My neighbor, he went and seeded his land this spring with one grain truck. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Where's your fertilizer? Yeah. And he said he put it all down last fall. I couldn't believe he did it. Yeah. But he seeded twice as much a day than having two trucks with fertilizer, right? And maybe, so maybe, did. maybe he wasn't even in there. It was like robotic yeah. or something. Well, <laughs> yeah. But I'm just, it was quite interesting that he yeah. says, I don't have enough time in the spring. So it was yeah. Kind of and, and what about, you know, loading up your cedar and your grain carts with, you know, tons and tons of fertilizer. And when do we Wait. run over? Wait. 
when it's the wettest time of the year, right? So you've got these compaction issues. Fall, and Tom Tens, was just talking, a yeah. little bit drier. You could probably get in there and not have the same compaction issues that we have with our, our drills. But I'm starting to feel like a salesman, but um, <laughs> we, we actually, like I said, we're just throwing out concepts and theory. Uh, the real proof will be in the next three year study. So mentioned uh, up north, it's actually the north that's leading this project, the SARTA group. So it was Dr. Uh, Cabell Gill that worked on this application with me and I think Tom was consulted as well. And, I, and he kept talking about copper and potassium. I don't care about copper and potassium, but uh, it is more of an issue for them. So you guys notice your, your, let's take a look at these soil samples. What do you guys see there? <coughs> Anything jump out at you as interesting? Needs FOSS, no, there's no nitrogen. It needs FOSS, nitrogen's looking pretty solid. Good. That's true. Is this a pre, before? This is, this is a before seeding. Yeah. And you'll notice that some of you guys actually have a rep one, a rep two, a rep three, and a rep four. And that's here, rep one, two, three, and four. Not a really big difference, but we're actually noticing. So the, somebody from rep one, why don't you yell out, what's the, what's the phosphorus on the first layer? 26, okay, what about the first layer? Yeah, and what is the first 19. layer? 19. Zero to three. Zero to three inch. So we, we specifically did a, a narrower soil sample. You like that I hand all these down to earth, man? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw you there. So. Zero to three, three to six, and then we went six to 12, and I also wanted to do 12 to 24. And I find out in, in the piece, they don't even bother testing 12 to 24 because they've got a clay layer or something that there's no point. Or it's frozen. Yeah, fro or frozen, right. <laughs> so layer one, we had uh, 19 pounds per acre and the zero to three inch. What about the three to six? Four. Down to four and the next one? Okay, is that stratified? Okay, yeah. any differences in rep two, three, and four you guys seeing? I don't see two. 15 of you have it. So how about uh, rep two? What's the, spit them out for me. 14, 14, three and three. Sounds pretty similar. Rep three, someone? Nine, two and four. And rep four? 15, three, four. Very, very similar on the FOSS. So, so that's really proving that nutrient stratification does exist, but does it matter? is really the next question, right? So, but you think zero to three, does it take long for that top layer to dry out? Next thing you know, you look at what's available, not a heck of a lot. There's, there's not enough POS where the roots need it. Possibly, yeah. And like, especially if that top three inches dries out, now you're counting on the more, you need, you need water to have nutrient movement. Diffusion, yeah. You need that. If you don't have it enough, the plant's got nothing, right? So there's another interesting thing about phosphorus fertilizers is that it actually becomes less available over time. Did you know that? Do you believe me? Yep. How about you, Tom? Do you believe me? Well, it reacts with the soil. Yeah. Yeah. It, it mostly binds, the calcium it it. and the magnesium and, it binds and so it. forth. And yeah. it becomes, it's not lost. It, takes it just becomes less right. soluble. It's still there. It can still become available, but our soils do tie up phosphorus. You're just yeah. trying hard not to say you're mobile, eh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so, you know, there's an interesting characteristic that we learned in when we started banding nitrogen too, that the, 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 the very fact of banding, you're actually changing the, the micro environment, right? That stuff that's in the middle of the band is sort of protected from reacting with the soil. It may actually stay available longer in a band. The same reason why we don't, we like it in nitrogen, we don't lose the nitrogen as it stays in the band. And it'll also change the pH around that band, which also changes the availability to the plant. So, so that's kind of a, an interesting concept to think about. Now that we're deep banding in a mobile nutrient in, a, in an environment that tends to be wetter, um, we've got more chance for, for that diffusion to occur. Anything to add there? Um, I think, you know, down in the corn belt, because you know high yields of corn they're putting on lots of fertilizer uh, in a lot of the areas they broadcast everything and in fact they used to have a lot of 
two by two fertilizer placement on a lot of the corn planters, they're gone. Yeah. They just broadcast everything, plant over everything, and they're really getting stratification of phosphorus towards the surface. So um, we've, we've been banding shallower and shallower in our systems. Like you said, you know, you, you place the seed and the band is what, one inch to the side and one inch down. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not very deep. And uh, a lot of the early research we did, even with nitrogen and banding, we were banding four inches or 10 centimeters down. We call that normal banding. But Nowadays, was, we'd call that deep banding. But that wasn't, but that wasn't no till though. Yeah, well, some of the early no till, but it was, yeah. So it's, some people say, maybe we shouldn't worry about it. Maybe we should have a tillage rotation. So once every four or five years, you actually cultivate the soil a bit and do some mixing. So there, there's some research looking at that. We may, we may very well have... Uh, and that leads to vertical tillage? Well, not necessarily a plow, but, you know, maybe a cultivator. We're, we're not... Yeah, we're not saying, you know, go back to inversion tillage with uh, really heavy discs and a plow, but um, where we put the nutrients and where they are in the seed bed of the plant, we need to get some answers, and that's why this... So instead of tilling, let, let's band the nutrients deeper. That's the logic of this project. There, there's one other thing, though, that, that whatever you, what you do with those guys that do the anhydrous, they, they, they rip up the soil, they, they, they bury it really deep, mm -hmm. right? Aren't, aren't they doing something similar? We Not just if they're putting only nitrogen. Okay, okay but they're nitrogen, yes, only nitrogen. And, and, they, and they knife it up and, 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 and they, they claim that they, they, they do a good job. So what do, you, what do you say to them? They should be putting down phosphorus at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Or, and potassium, and, and, and maybe they'll, some... They'll end, the, and, and, and they'll yeah. end in anhydrous, right? Yeah. And it's, a popular, it's still the cheapest way. Mm. If they lose 30% 30, 30 they still... I don't know. Yeah. Well, it depends on the area. Yeah. yeah. Tom, if you put down uh, nitrogen and potassium and sulfur and all everything together in a deep band in the fall would it keep the phosphate or anything a little bit more mobile or not it would but there's always if you have too much nitrogen then we we call it that band has to mellow because the the roots will start growing if there's too much ammonium there the roots can't grow into it so the the less mobile phosphorus and potassium will be sitting there in this yeah. zone of ammonia and the roots may not get it. So, uh, but by doing it in the fall, yeah. there's more time for the nitrogen to move out and then the roots can get in there better. So, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of factors is going it, on. Yes? The spacing, like in terms of some of these immobile nutrients, if you are going to put on the fall a seven inch better than 13, better than, you know, 20, like if I use the mid row bands on the drill, that's 20 inch spacing. Is that too far apart or should I be going more like 10 inch or, or even narrow I seven would, inch. you know, if you look at that chart on the mobility, <clears throat> the more, the less mobile it is, probably narrower banding would be better. But then there's a point of practicality. Yeah. You know, 10, 12 inch would, I think, is would be ideal. Um, I wouldn't want to band phosphorus on 20 inch centers because the, the plants in between aren't going yeah, to get much benefit. Yeah, even that would be hard pressed to say to get through this. The yeah. Great what, clay of this start, what do you startup. think, Ken? On yeah. That? yeah, I think if if we're talking about an immobile thing, and we spread it out further, then you're 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 actually limiting access to it. Um, that's my gut on it. I I don't think for nitrogen it would matter, but for the immobile ones it probably would. And then you think about what you do to your field over time. Like like I said, we all have GPS guidance, whether it's RTK or not but we're putting everything in bands and straight lines year after year after year. I'm actually really questioning whether we're even doing a half decent job soil sampling anymore. You know, if you've got a one inch band and a 10 inch row and you go out and do 20 cores and I don't even think and you're actually getting accurate results because it depends on whether you hit these bands or not, especially when it comes to the immobile nutrients too. However, consistency in phosphorus results I see as very consistent over time and right away I could tell when a lab makes mistakes back when we used to test it somewhere else I mean yeah. 
but I, it was perfect Whoa. because all <laughs> all I had to do yeah. is call for a retest because I knew immediately that phosphorus doesn't change like that. Yeah. Nitrogen, you may notice rep one, two, and three, and this tiny little area is really different. There's a difference of 100 pounds of nitrogen between one of those reps. Yeah, but one and two would be four lengths and three after <laughs> Yeah, so, so you know, you got to sort of weigh all of those different factors in, in developing appropriate nutrient plans. But, but to answer his question, how close do you think we get? Well, the, in this case, we're going to put it right on top. No, 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 no. Like 10 inch, 12 inch, what do you think? The spacing of the bands. Oh, I'd like to see it match the row spacing of your planter perfectly. Well, so you'd like to see a 10 inch maybe? Yeah. Well, I mean, th the, th that's the, the this number is. four shows you the mobile, light, you know. Yeah. How far does that phosphorus spread? Is that two inches? I mean, if you're if you're on a twenty inch and you're banding it, that right there, that's not doing it. You know? Yeah, that's right. <coughs> right, right. Well, and the, the plant's needs change over time too, right? Yeah. So this is a this is the study. I don't want to belabor this so far, but uh, basically, no sorry. Could you call this no well, it actually doesn't look like it, but it is. Um, we had lo really low residue that we went into, but we picked this spot on purpose because of the low background phosphorus. Oh. Because the first thing, and I think you picked up on it right away, you need phosphorus. You're not going to see any benefit to deep banding if you've got loads of phosphorus in the soil. So. The first requirement for a response is to actually have a deficiency. And we, we chose this location for that reason. So we literally uh, you know, took, took some recommendations. If it was 30 pounds of phosphorus actual that we wanted to put down, in our deep banding treatments, we did triple. And then we're gonna compare that to shallow banded, which is basically either with the seed or, or just slightly side banded for three years. So this is actually, it's important to look at the results over the three year term. And then we've got every treatment of, of potassium by itself, phosphorus by itself, and copper by itself. We're not really deficient on copper, so I'm, I'm personally, at this location, only interested, or mostly interested in the phosphorus. We don't tend to get results, uh, any response to potassium because we have a pretty good background load. Now yep. this is both with and without, right? So yeah. So how'd you manage that with the, with the, with the, with the equipment? You Our, drive into the next We have block? RTK. No, did, did you yeah. drive into the next plot? How do, how do you get... We actually have pathways, so our, sec, our second pathway is big enough to turn around in. That was a tractor? Yeah. There was a question up here. So your plan is to not have to fertilize for the next three years then? Not, not, the, not phosphorus, no. We'll do it once and then leave it and see what happens over time. So, so you know, if you could go to a system where you, you deep banded phosphorus every three years. Yeah. And looked after your crop. So when you way. get phosphorus yeah. really cheap, you just load up, right? There's all these little things you could possibly do. Are you doing anything with microchem? Not in this. Well, yeah. copper. Just co just yeah, copper. just copper. But we don't expect a copper response. I wouldn't expect a copper. No, because uh, I don't believe boron is ha has the same immobility as. No, it's quite uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I've learned, you know, a uh, mosaic makes a potash product with 1% boron, or is it half a percent, I think. And they've actually got some interesting third-party research showing that even though boron is mobile in the soil, by mixing it with the potash and spreading it out, they're actually getting better boron uptake. So sometimes distribution, even of the mobile nutrients, can be beneficial too. So, Because with boron, we're, we're going at such a low rate, even though it's mobile, if you spread things out, there can be some benefits. But that's that's another topic. We, we'll get back on. No, I, th I think we're we're pretty much wrapped up. We, if you want, we can take a walk through the plots, but otherwise we're going to head towards the tent.